and there was no question that you know Peter hadn't done anything. It's just like a kid mucking in the mud. I mean, whose boy hasn't mucked in the mud at some point? He said, this man has a trouble problem with boys. Now, the problem that we have is that you citizens don't know when you're talking to a park police person. We're cops. There's no park police, they're cops. What happened was at some point in the Fairfax County budgeting process, the police budget ran out of money, but the park had a lot of money left over. So they just shoved a bunch of police officers in the park, painted the cars saying park police. And so when citizens would come and talk to them, this is coming from this number one of the top three people. When citizens would come and talk to them, they thought they were talking to the tree fuzz, to the park police. <laughs> when in fact they're talking to actual police officers. He said, can you do something about this? Because we don't like it because we're talking to the citizens and we're regular cops, we're not police, uh, tree, uh, not park police. And so I told my uh, supervisor, Jim Scott at that time, if anybody remembers. And I told him what I just told you and it was changed the next week, that next week because uh, they were required to uh, take the park ranger off and say police and be, be presented to the public as police officers. But they were getting away with a lot of stuff against citizens who didn't realize that. Now it turns out that the other kid with Peter was the son of Senator Mathias's legislative aide. <laughs> and oh. the lawyers in his office had already called and said, Whatever the police tell you, don't pay attention to them, just tell them we'll sue them. <laughs> no, literally, that was the, the word that came out of the office. So we were armed. I mean, it wasn't that I went in there not knowing what I was doing. I had support from, from places behind me. But, and then they rolled over. I mean, they realized they were way on the wrong side of what was going, what had to happen. But it was just an interesting situation because if somebody hadn't been as you probably all know I'm mouthy and I don't back down. No. I don't no. back. No. I don't back down easily if I think something is going on. Yeah. Uh, it's wrong. Again, okay. against Peter. Who wants their son to have an arrest record? Yeah. I mean, you don't know what can happen if he wants a top secret clearance. I mean, I had no idea if that would travel off or not. I have yeah. another van story, and it's Lee Perkins' <laughs> van story. I was afraid to ride in the van. I thought, you I thought so everybody who lived in Virginia were drunken bubbas who carried rifles. <laughs> but but on this the one day, she took her coming. courage in hand and was driving the van in Washington, D.C. The ERA van? The ERA van in Washington, D.C. Now, Lee doesn't drive a lot. And she came down, I think it was 9th yeah. Street, but anyway, towards Pennsylvania. Yeah, that was during a time when I didn't own a car. I had this yeah. like 10 year stretch in there where I did not own a car. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, she had the van. And turning in, going southbound on a one-way street, turning into Pennsylvania <laughs> Avenue, Pennsylvania being divided at that point, she went past it and turned into the wrong way down Pennsylvania Avenue. And of course, immediately gets pulled over by a cop. And he says, I'd like to see the license and registration. And I, there was some issue with that. And, he, and she, she said, probably the registration wasn't there, God only knows. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was licensed, but I had no idea where the registration yeah. was. Yeah, and, and, and he, he said, well, i got to call this in then. And she said, who would steal this? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, lady, transportation is transportation. <laughs> and she said, this is not transportation. <laughs> this is a political statement. <laughs> and he never took it. <laughs> I'd like, I'd like to, to add like the uh, naked statutes also. Um, at the time of that picket of the moral majority, I worked across the street for a real estate broker and management firm. And uh, I crossed the street from what? Capitol Hill. From, from the moral majority. The moral, the moral majority. majority. Okay. Where we did the My boss was a licensed real estate broker, and he knew other licensed real estate brokers and property managers. And he was friends with the property manager of the building that housed the moral majority. And the naked statues. And the naked statues. <laughs> and they wanted to get the naked, the moral majority after that action wanted the naked statues removed from the lobby. <laughs> and, you know, he, after conferring with the owners of the building, who I think at that time was an out-of-state investment company, 
told you know told them in effect, but probably nicely, that the owners said, you know, the statues stay, live with it or move out. He'd been trying to get them to move out for a long time because they were pain in the ass tenants. <laughs> Well, I think Nick is saying, well, they have civil uh, rights, don't they? No, we I think understand so. that the, um, all the statues around the perimeter of the, of the ceiling of Union Station were originally nude. Yes. And uh, the, there was a public outcry, and they had to redo all the statues <laughs> to put covering on them. <laughs> uh, Unlike the Sistine Chapel, where the same thing happened, exactly the same thing. <laughs> but it's been cleared away. Well, but, but the, one thing Michelangelo did is he started painting the faces of the bishops that mm. wanted to co cover the. Uh, oh, he outed them? <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, he started painting them as the, the, the people in hell. <laughs> so, so, but, but then there was a period where they did make them cover them. Historically, when they did make them cover, that's the, the, you know, And a them. dear friend of mine, Simone my Aunt Cap, Simone was, was an art historian, historian and a restorer. And after the flood in Florence, she was invited by the Vatican to come down into the basement because apparently they hadn't just put plaster fig leaves over the genitalia and allowed the statues to remain whole, but apparently someone had very enthusiastically knocked all the penises off. So they had a huge box, a box <laughs> of all the penis, and they wanted to hire her to come and write and to return the, the penises to the right statues. And she turned them down. <laughs> As a good feminist, she decided that that was just not what she wanted to spend her life doing. Yeah, the Simone 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 and she has to unfix. Come on, that's I'm ready to behave. We have that, that story though. Why did you say George awesome. was trying to be? Um, <laughs> what do you mean? So, Why are you censoring us now? Yeah, well, well because, because we have like an hour and 15 minutes before we're supposed to leave if they decide to kick us out. And so I sort of need to focus us a little bit. You want us At to that point? point? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I do. Um, we could focus on guesses, perhaps. But um, what I really want to ask you about is. Um, Preparation, the chain took preparation, the ladder took preparation, the shoe and the walk to Richmond took May, preparation. How did we get those things? How did you, well, how did you get ready, you know? And for each of those sort of major acts, you all worked for months sometimes, well, right? I'll start out with to the get chain ready. So, I mean, pick maybe the walk to Richmond. We could start there and work our way out and around. I think before we end, I think we should hear from Mary Ann the political activities that went on after Jim Thompson was defeated. I mean, there were actions every year um, leading up to the ERA final vote in 82, so we need to allow some time for that as well. I think so we don't have to do that now. We can talk about the change of the shoes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, there were, one of the things that I did, um, I became an expert in mimeographing, because we were very poor. We didn't get stuff printed in those days. We did get sophisticated enough to have electronically cut stencils. But the people at Gastetna up in North Arlington just would shudder to see me coming at Christmas because you had to decide in December what your entire ERA printing was for the next year because green ink was on half price sale in December. <laughs> and so you bought all your green ink. But some of the sheer mechanics behind some of these actions or campaigns were astounding. We did, I don't know how many cases of paper through this mimeograph machine, hand folded. But when we started the 1975 campaign, we, we had no resources. So four women, uh, Susan Akins, myself, Charlie Armstrong, and Jen Bell, we were the four that started it. We met and we go to the, we, we want to, and I had the plan, and the plan was to identify uh, all the people uh, who, at that first, first stage, all the people who were unregistered in A precincts, seven A precincts, where it was in the west of Alexandria, which was the transient part of our community, the, the liberal part, the young part, uh, to uh, identify them and um, Call them up on a dummy survey, and if they were pro, they pro ARA or not pro ARA, and if they were 
not pro ARA, their cards went into the trash or their name went into the trash. If they were pro ARA, we had to get going to the door to register without them having any idea that we were the folks who'd call them up to see on the survey to see who they were. But so so you have to get have much, you have to know who these people are. You have to have a text cards to keep a record. We didn't have computers back then. You have to have the Haynes directory, aha, uh -huh, which has oh. the Haynes directory. Yeah. Oh no, yeah. which is which is by street addresses and names of people with their phone numbers and street addresses. And obsolete uh, by the time it's printed. Uh, but better than nothing. Right. And better than nothing. But all of these resources were controlled by men. I have everything. The, the, the Haynes directory was controlled. The limited access to that. We couldn't get voter registration lists. That was illegal for us to have. So, and we had no money. So we had this interesting meeting. I forgot all about this. Four of us. Was it? Maybe this is for, this is not maybe where spirituality comes in, but certainly ethics. Was it okay to steal for a cause that we thought was so justice so justified and right? Steal was from home okay to steal mm -hmm. from those who control the resources that we needed. And the and the it's just a re. Re redistribution, yeah. of re yeah. redistribution of wealth and redistribution of information. So each one of us agreed to steal a certain number of index cards out of our office. <laughs> <laughs> Rachel Kupferberg referred to this as the, the firm's involuntary contribution. Truly, <laughs> so Charles and I had serious ethical issues about this. Susan, whose vote sort of car carried the day, we found out later that she just stole anyway. <laughs> she, <laughs> she was a theft for people. Like that. Uh, but the Haynes directory was in like in an, an insurance office, a real estate office. And so we found a feminist who worked there as a secretary that let us come in at night and Xerox the pages on the work <laughs> issue. So so we pieced to get all of this type of preparation to get us to be able. Telephones? Oh, we had five telephones in Sue because Cousin Melanie from Birmingham came to visit, and she had to have her own private <laughs> line. So we were just like, oh, I just can't possibly stay in this part without my own line. <laughs> and then, and then, and then, so, then Susan's children got very upset because Mother and Cousin Melanie were occupying for all the phone lines, and so they each had to have a line. So we got four lines that way. Anyway, we, this all this sort of piecing together resources that we we needed through lying and cheating and stealing, <laughs> a, a lot of how the preparation that was, it was done. But it was all done according to a plan. We had a plan of why we needed these resources, what resources we needed, and how we were going to use them. And I was telling Pat earlier that one of my little capsulized memories was we would go to Susan's house and phone and phone and phone and phone. And we had these cards of everybody, because again, the computers would write everything down on us. Uh, index card, and I went to the refrigerator one day and opened the refrigerator, and index card fell out. <laughs> it was permeated with it. But it's poor Susan's children. I mean, how they ever survived, I don't know. I don't know. But by 1979, we had gotten so oh, sophisticated we were, we were, we were cool. that the whole Fairfax 19 project office supplies were, were provided by the U.S. Navy. Uh, from <laughs> a, a, a petty uh, officer um, in our um, U.S. Navy. I think it was called Midnight Requisitions oh, requisition. uh, by a petty, chief petty officer who worked in the Secretary of the Navy office in the Pentagon. But, and we had excellent supplies. But, you know, the so right wing, we got better, the right wing got better. And there was this, they, they developed this tactic of us getting the true, horrible, awful things they would say about our candidates. So we couldn't let that happen without figuring out a counter strategy. So they used a certain mail house. Well, there was a closet feminist in the mail house who would let us know when they were getting ready to do their, when their truck was leaving for the Merrifield post office. Remember this? And so then we made friends with the people, the post people who worked the night shift at the Merrifield post office go to the post office, and because we, we do a little mailing, but we had to mail, and we'd go there, and we'd wait on the loading dock, and when the trucks pulled in, because we knew which mailing house they were coming from, the people
people on the dock would look the other way and we would snitch the next thing. <laughs> not kidding, right? No, I'm not kidding. <laughs> Angels all. Yeah, so, so we would know what they were going to, what people were going to get in their mail on Monday, and we would do door-to-door -door drops on Sunday, refuting the charges that they were having until Monday. Jerry Farwell, eat your heart out. We, we, uh, it was. It's so good to be young and alive. What can I, what can I say? Wow. <laughs> tactics to, to counter tactics and all that. Yeah. By the way, one of the things that uh, I had wanted to reference, Lisa, Lisa Kathleen Brandy is the current uh, archivist at the Museum of American History for women. She has Edith Mayo's old position. And um, I spoke to her a couple of weeks ago because I'm in the process of signing a deed to them of materials because they will keep ephemera. Like the Schlesinger Library, which has a lot of women's material in it, for instance, will not take ephemera. And we have even the uh, cuffs that women were put on women when they were arrested in feminist actions and the banners. And, the buttons and so on, and like the Schlesinger won't keep the ephemera, and it seemed important to me to keep that all together because it was it was important. So she was calling me about when there might be a date to sign, and in that conversation, she said the one thing I want that I do not have is the ERA band. 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 She said band. that band would be the center the of an amazing <laughs> exhibit. <laughs> You're calling this ephemera? We did try very hard. Uh, Edie Mayo was, was in that position at the time. I, I spoke and with her, wrong. and she w went off to find out if they could take the van, and she said, no, we can't take the van. She took several months to, I'm sure she you know, twisted every arm she could. And uh, we ended up, I did not want the van, the van rusting in a used van lot or anything. So I arranged for the van to be crushed and oh. and um, turned into, you know, scrap. Useful items. And we had a van farewell party, which I think Julie Cloninger organized at the Lyceum in Alexandria. And we had, I had the van towed there um, it was a night meeting. I wanted people to be, if they wanted to go out and be photographed with the van and, and just take a last look and say goodbye to the van. Um, and then the next day they were to crush it. Uh, crush it. Uh, we have one, I did do one poster of various pictures of the van, which I have to say I proudly have a note from Marianne and Jean Crawford and I think Pat Linton that they signed my copy of that poster. And I have some other copies of it. I did this, you know, shortly before, you know, the van demise. Um, I think we had a nice party. We talked about the van. We talked, and, and it was a reception with food and, and so forth at the Lyceum that night. I remember, I'm sure a lot of you were there, but that was how we called an end to the van. I, um, you know, it was having motor troubles and wasn't being used for When it. did it not? <laughs> I remember Ron going down 95. I remember that all too vividly. And your story about taking it in for its inspection in Alexandria. Oh God, oh and the God. little man at the garage said, she needs a little help. <laughs> I, I drove it from time to time. Uh, but that was the second van. That was the second van. Right. We need to know there was a first van. It was a first van. With with signs, with with cloth banners banner 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 banner. it, it was actually a pickup truck that um, had like an RV unit on the back mm -hmm. of it. And uh, late Layton Brown. Layton Brown. Brown. Layton Brown. We we were looking for a van. I said, okay, anybody got a van? Who's got a van? And he's like, oh, I've got an idea. I'll, and I'll leave it in my driveway out in Prince William County. You can come by, drive it, see whether you like it. And that was the pickup truck with this, our recreational thing, right. put into the bed, back of the bed of the truck. So actually to get into that, you had to 
reach up, oh, uh, practically have a ladder over the doors, and then you had to grab hold of these metal poles and hoist yourself inside. Anyway, Carol Pudline and I went out to um, Prince William County, and 